Hello and welcome to this uh, podcast that we have uh, chosen to call the uh, weird stuff that we have seen in our uh, deployment projects. My name is uh, Ken Dagelund. I'm a senior chief uh, architect from, from Cortec. And with me today here in the studio, I have my very good friend. John Avridmark. I work as a technology officer with TrueSec, a small consulting company based in Sweden. And in this session, we'll focus on as Ken said, some things, random yeah. things we encountered during our various um, Yeah, but actually we, we are going to focus on stuff that we wish we hadn't seen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and speaking of stuff that we, we, sh we haven't seen, we, we had actually made a list. So let me just flip <coughs> over to Ken's screen over here. Here we go. We can get that one up and running. Yeah. Nice. So, so just as a as kind of a quick agenda, um, this is the stuff that we are going to discuss and talk over. So first of all, these days, modern device management, that's a huge discussion. How do we get there? What is you know, the, the showstopper? We have, seen some, uh, we have seen some weird decisions that are like, hey, you wish you hadn't done that because now we have to almost do it all over again. Um, discussions are around domain joining devices, that one is huge, especially here at Ignite. Should we like picking the right domain name and, and things? Yeah, and, 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 and also figuring out, do I really need to, do, you know, to join my old fashioned domain or could I do a, uh, an Azure AD join instead? So there are a lot of good questions. Um, and then we also have some horror stories. Uh, I remember when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you, you told me the best one. I, I'm, I'm still a little shaky about that one because that's got to be the most horrible things I've ever yeah, seen not, here. Not, not too bright, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, so um, let's, why don't we start with some of the things we, uh, we definitely want to look out for in order to succeed uh, or have a successful Windows 10 deployment system. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So when, when kicking off a project, when starting to go from Windows 7 to Windows 10, because that's where most customers are, are going these days, uh, not maybe all devices or all machines at the same time, but they are starting pilot projects. And the last 13 months has been very interesting to see companies going from uh, Windows 7 to Windows 10 in a quickly rapid pace, much more quickly than, than I think uh, ever before uh, in Windows history ever. But there are some things that, that is really helpful to, to pay attention to. For example, I was working with one customer based out in Stockholm uh, in the, by the end of last year, and they tried out to start to deploy a bunch of Windows 10 machines to an existing platform where they already have a bunch of Windows 7 devices, as most companies uh, do. And the thing is, they were using AppLocker. So they have restricted the use of just everything but a certain application or a few certain applications. But in Windows 10, even the start menu and the uh, search, those are applications. And I don't know if you tried to use a Windows 10 <laughs> box without those. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. You have to do everything in the command line. It's like, it's, it's like Windows 10 Core. It's like Windows 10 <laughs> Core. And it's for techie, mm, maybe. But end users, no, no. no. So something I do recommend customers uh, do starting to do this project is, at least in the pilot, uh, create a separate OU. And start fresh with group policies if you have the chance. Because Windows or group policies has been around since, you know, Windows 2000, 16 years ago. And companies started then and they just added more and more and more stuff. <coughs> they may have hundreds of policies. I, I'll bet you there will still be companies out there with 16 year old group policies. Yes. And they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, people left the company like a long time ago. So I see opportunity, or Windows 10 as an opportunity to start fresh. Yeah. So create a separate OU, link in only the very basic policies that you need, and, and well, just have a few of them. Another one of the, the challenges um, that, that we have encountered uh, is the Windows servicing part. I mean, there's been a lot of talks back and forth about, you know, when we get to Windows 10, should we, should we upgrade a DOS like twice a year because we don't have the manpower to do that? Um, and, and it hasn't really been like that. Now we finally have uh, 1607, the latest anniversary build. So now we have, now we have three builds here. Yeah. Uh, but the first one is still supported. I mean, the, the first... For a few more months. Yeah, for, <laughs> for, for a few more months, yeah. Um, so how, how do you see organizations go ahead, you know, and, and, and dealing with those Windows servicing? I mean, here at Ignite, there's been a ton of sessions around 
Windows servicing. And many of them has been focusing on be prepared for the load on your network, yeah. starting to do Windows 10. And Niaus had a session yesterday, and I'm going to fire up my, my favorite um, WordPad uh, utility. Let me just switch over to this machine also so you can see it, which would uh, be helpful. Yes, so Windows 10, we are at 16.07. They are the current branch which most companies should be using. Uh, we are talking about, on average, a gig of data per month going down to these devices in terms of updates. Uh, normal updates, quality updates they call it. And uh, if you add that to a two year period, you start to end up with having 24 gig of updates uh, that has to be transferred to these devices. Then you have the feature upgrades that you mentioned twice a year. They are typically around 3.5 gig in size for the 64-bit uh, platform. You have four of those over two years, so that ends up to about uh, 14 gigabytes, if I did the math right. Um, so it's actually more efficient to, to deploy these every now and then. In, in, instead of doing the other ones? Yes. That's, that's kind of an interesting way of, of, of looking at this, because uh, who would have known that? Uh, people are so focused on you know, the major ones that they yeah. completely forget about the smaller ones. Yeah. So, so that's, that's definitely something to take into consideration. There. Yeah. There was a session yesterday um, around planning for, for this data. Um, so if you haven't catched that one, I highly recommend to do that. There is an Ignite channel on YouTube where all these sessions are being posted, uh, publicly available. So uh, just go ahead and, and, and view those because there are techniques available to help you uh, reduce the, the pain from this. Um, yeah. so, so what kind of tools do we recommend? Because right now we have, I mean, we can do everything manually. No. Probably, probably don't <laughs> recommend doing no. that. We have uh, we have System Center Configuration Manager, yeah. and we have. Can we do this with MDT standalone? Or? I mean, for for updating, it's basically come down to either WSUS standalone or WSUS in combination with the the uh, uh, whoops sub role um, software update pointing config manager. Yeah. Uh, the interesting part with this guy is that Microsoft is now offering uh, standalone uh, express packages that you can download. They're really, really big to download, but from a client, they're very efficient to apply. So even if this package is a gig, a client that is somewhat up to date already have most of it since they're cumulative. So the next month, it will only apply the delta, like 100 meg or something. Config Manager does not yet have that uh, express packet yet, so they still download everything down yeah. to the client. Yeah. But then you have other technologies. You have peer-to-peer -peer in Config Manager coming up eventually, uh, also for these guys. Uh, you have third-party solutions doing this. You have branch cache as an option. I know that uh, Andreas has a session tomorrow about, about branch cache, but there are things that can help you. Uh, you have delivery optimization yep. in Windows 10, uh, currently only working for WSUS and Microsoft Update directly, but also it's peer-to-peer -peer technology from a company they acquired and back uh, in uh, and the days. Especially the peer-to-peer -peer technology, I mean, we can expect to see a lot of that coming uh, because Microsoft, they, they, they clearly have to address this. This yeah. is a, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it an issue because it's not an issue, but it's a big challenge, uh, a big challenge for a lot of us. I know when I'm looking at the, uh, 14 gigabyte of data, I, 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 I can mention a lot of my customers where it would take weeks to deploy that. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, so think about it, you have two sites, you have a slow LAN link, LAN link in between, and it, it takes forever to yeah. get the bits down. Yeah. Um, but so speaking, if, if I go over to um, the, the Config Manager console here, this is a uh, Config Manager current branch, 1606, which is the current production build. They're all later previews. 1609 is the latest preview. Um, but in here, you obviously have uh, you have the servicing um, plan, servicing model for Windows 10. But so far, I'm actually using uh, task sequences yeah. to uh, deploy the feature upgrades, not the quality updates. Those are normal patch management in, in Config Manager, but I use it for this. And the reason is you get so much control, much more control, I think, than, than the servicing plan will give yeah. you. Yeah. Allowing you to do things before doing anything actually do a check, is the machine ready to go? Yes, no, I can do a compatibility scan. 
and then the result of this scan I can actually has a condition on the step that actually does the upgrade. So is the return code from this test, am I good to go? Is happiness, and this is uh, the code for happiness. Uh, then I will do this action. Yeah. And I can start adding drivers. This is mostly useful if you go from Windows 7 to Windows 10. But I also use this to go from Windows 10 to Windows 10. Yeah. So yeah. I have 15.11. I want to go to 16.07. Yeah, I've, 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 we kind of see the same. Uh, uh, when you go from Win 10 to Win 10, I'm still not using the servicing plan because there is a lot of stuff that gets reapplied. Yes. Uh, I know Microsoft are working on that. I've uh, saw some articles on that will change in the in the later versions that it will actually honor the uh, built-in apps that we have removed. Uh, but for now, I. This, this would be the right way, in my opinion, to go as yeah, well. Absolutely. I mean, it's all about control, and I know you, you love control. I love control, <laughs> total control, I, I do, yeah. I do. So, yeah. So, that's a few things around, around uh, servicing, but you also did have some other notes over there, so let us go back to your machine for a little bit. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we have an interesting one, which is, which is often a showstopper, and that's the, uh, that's the bias to UEFI. And, even though it might be a, a showstopper, I mean, it's, I mean, you have to do it. Uh, I, we see organizations who are not doing it, and you know, just go ahead and deploy that, and I, will, I, would, I would call that a, that's a big mistake. So, uh, so why? Why do you need to convert to UEFI? Why is it not good enough to yeah, stay on BIOS as you have been doing for Windows 7 for the past I don't, I, I, eight I years, seven years? I think maybe BIOS was what invented in the 70s? Probably, yes. <laughs> and I mean... In our time frame. In our uh, time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, I mean, it's, this, is, this is legacy way of controlling your machines, right? We have, uh, we have a lot of, we've seen a lot of security issues with this. We also know that uh, Secure Boot and all of the new uh, um, options in the Windows defense stacks actually requires that we go to uh, UEFI. So it's, although it's a, it's a good question, I, I feel like it's, hey, this is a, this is a must. We, we can't even discuss that. The only thing we can discuss is how do you go from bias to UEFI? And, and if you guys need uh, ammunition to, to actually, all right, why should we enable UEFI? Um, if I go to my demo machine, I actually made a list. <laughs> um, let's see here if, um, if I go to my blog, Deployment Research, and search for UEFI and type it, type it correctly. I put together a list of the current features in Windows 10, and I expect this to actually expand over time also. But, but these guys, this is the current list of features that require you to be on UEFI. And you are not on UEFI. Most companies are not on UEFI already because they're using Windows 7. And Windows 7 is a pain in the neck to deploy on a UEFI, uh, even though it's somewhat doable, but it's, it's, it's painful, so companies didn't do it. Um, and, and that means that you have to convert these. And Microsoft does not support that during an in-place upgrade. Uh, the config manager team is working to get it easier. There is actually code now in the technical preview 1609 that makes it easier. But for now, uh, to be um, get that automated, you, you basically have to create your own sequences. And that's the thing I like about the community, because there the, uh, has been a lot of um, posts and articles done around how to do this in automated fashion. So uh, Mike Terrell, I know, has one post. Yeah. Uh, Jürgen Nilsson has one. Uh, Nikolai Anderson has one as well. Pretty sure I saw something from Brady also. Yeah, plus, plus, I know uh, Mike had a session here yesterday. Yes. Uh, a well attended session. So, so I mean, it is, it is something you, you need to um, dive into, definitely. Yeah, I mean, shorthand story. If I go to my demo machine here, or just open up, this conversion, even though not you know, in place directly from Microsoft right now, it's doable. It certainly is doable. Uh, if you look out for, for some of the community um, efforts. And everything can be done automated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Typically, you have two sequences we do this. One that actually runs the backup and do the configuration, and, and then you have a normal bare metal deployment after that. I've also seen some nice automation around a refresh sequence that actually uh, But as long works. as we remember, this is a one-timer, right? Yes. So you cannot afford not to do it. That's, that's, that's my opinion. Just take the hit now and get going. Exactly. In, in Another interesting question is, should we, so what if we are still deploying Windows 7? 
should we, you know, continue to deploy Windows 7 on, 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 you know, on BIOS legacy mode, or should we actually, you know, use UEFI for those as well? Well, first of all, maybe stop deploying Windows 7. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, there yeah. are ways on newer machines to put them into a compatibility mode, so you actually make it easier to convert to UEFI later. Yeah. Um, if that's an approach for the hardware you're having, that, that's a nice thing, that's a nice preparation you can do. Do I see companies do that much? No. No, <laughs> not at all. Because, I mean, we've been deploying Win 7 for so many years, so yeah. we just, you know, once, it's, once it's going, it's, it's just going yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, some, of the, some of the other topics we have uh, discussed here at, uh, at Ignite has also been, you know, all the, all the modern devices. Um, and I'm, those of you who are familiar with me, you know, I've, I've been working with SCCM, a big fan of that product for... Uh, and Intune. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for for at least twenty years, um, and I'm I'm kind of a sworn SCCM guy, but I um, I I I've seen the light. I will say um, I I'm definitely interested in taking the discussion about you know do we really need to go the old-fashioned management route, or, or is the only thing we really care about uh, actually the data? Yeah. Uh, and especially for uh, for uh, for mobile devices, uh, do we do we even need to enroll those mobile devices, or should we just you know uh, create some what we call MAM policies where we just protect the application? So even without enrolling the device, um, you know we can still protect our data. There are so many options now. I mean, you can have the full agent installed. You can skip the full agent and just do mobile device management. Yeah, yeah. You have all devices that cannot have a full agent. Um, and I would say a, a big mistake nowadays is not to take the uh, conversation. So, you know, if, if you go in and you base your knowledge on what it looked like one year ago, I mean, you make a huge mistake. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm not saying that, you know, with, with, with uh, modern device management, we can go in and, and, and replace a config manager for uh, 150,000, you know, with traditional desktop management. But there is, there is a lot of stuff that we can do in there. And I, I, I know that you brought a customer here to Ignite uh, for a session about a project you guys did, yeah. uh, especially around um, yeah. these type of management. Um, exactly. And tomorrow? That's, that's, that's tomorrow, 12.30. 30. It's yeah. one of the last sessions of Ignite. Yeah, it's one of the best time slots. For yeah, <laughs> grand finale. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. what we have all been waiting for right yeah. after the party. Um, so why don't we kind of run uh, or finish off here with some of the uh, horror stories that we have, <laughs> have met. And this is, I, we might be smiling and laughing, but it's really not that funny. It's like. Yeah, I, I was having a conversation with a, a config manager admin based out of uh, Chicago. <laughs> and, and they were doing, uh, that was funny, but they were doing a WMI repair, which you may have to do every now and then on a machine that is broken, but that's like the last resort. But they had this in a startup script, so every <laughs> time a machine would boot, it will actually try to repair WMI. And I can tell you, the config manager client was not happy about that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this, I mean, you know, you know you're into this and you might be a little nerdy, but this might be the funniest thing I've heard in I don't know how many years. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> Maybe the, uh, the saddest part. And, and the thing is when we discussed this, I mean, you came up with this story as number one. I was like, okay, you win. <laughs> yeah. I, I did see a similar one in the forums and that was actually uh, uh, another admin, I don't know where, nope. but they tried to do this uh, <laughs> on the site server. They did? Yes, on the site server, <laughs> which is about the most stupid thing you can do on a site server. Yeah. And the reply, I think it was from Sherry that replied, was basically, well, I have a fix for you. Apply for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's one of the, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so afraid that the, <laughs> the ones that I have, they're not even close to that, but, but you know, some of the things that I'm seeing is uh, management being super, yeah, you know, they just want to have data, and they, they think that uh, that SCCM is like a real-time uh, system. So yeah. uh, I've seen software inventory scans running every 50 minutes, which is kind of interesting because it can easily take three, four, five hours to actually finish a scan. Yes. So so I had, uh, I had around 25,000 devices never reporting back in because they were constantly running. up yeah, and yeah. things. 
Yeah, that's it's not only the client itself. I mean, it, it will send that data up, and then the site server is supposed to process it. Yeah, but, but <laughs> the, the, the thing here is that we never really got any data up. And, uh, and when, when you're running, a, as you know, when you're running the software inventory scan, we can't run any hardware scan, and we can't run any discovery uh, scans either. So that's kind of, and that would be heartbeat discovery, of course. So that's, I mean, we didn't get any information back from, uh, from those clients. I, I've seen similar stuff for, uh, not for inventory and hardware inventory, but for collection updates. Yeah. Uh, was working with a customer in, in, in uh, well, Canada, and, and uh, they uh, had a shortened down, some were like five minutes interval, full collection, and some were 15 and some were two hours, but they have hundreds of them. And I mean, this the system they call EVA log file was just yeah. spinning around. That, that, that's, uh, that is a classic, and, and we need to know that the collection evaluator, that is single threaded, Yes. meaning that we're not really processing that many changes at, 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 at so the time. So it was so busy doing that, that of course they wouldn't be updated. Yeah, so the, the, good, the good thing about this is that we do have a tool here. I mean, we do have uh, in the toolkit, we have yes. uh, the collection evaluator yep. viewer. So when, when you go ahead and in, in, install the uh, resource kit tool, yep. I mean, it's right there and it should be it should be part of, uh, I you know. I think I actually installed the latest version of this guy. Let me double check. Yeah. If not, I can totally do it. So let's see what machine I'm on. I'm on this guy. Um, Config Manager Toolkit, Server Tools. Exactly. Uh, yes, this is the CA uh, uh, Viewer, the Collection Evaluation Viewer. So That's I will connect to the site server, and then I will see all my, you know, What's going on in yeah. the system? And that's 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 your Monday morning cup <laughs> of coffee right there. Yeah. And uh, you know, once you've done that, you can start punishing your fellow colleagues because you will you will see, you know, exactly what collections are the yeah. bad guys. Yeah. Uh, and how long they took to run? Because sometimes I've seen like interesting queries on a collection <laughs> <laughs> that, that like sub selections and just take forever to run it. Yeah. And if you have a collection, it says like takes two minutes. That that's bad. These are two seconds. This is good. Yeah. I've, I've seen uh, my record so far is 19 minutes. Oh, damn. So <laughs> and that wow. kind of has an impact when you're deploying Windows 10 machines because you're waiting for them to show up in the yeah. uh, right collection. Uh, and it, so, so this, is, this is super important when you're troubleshooting because we have all heard that you know, SCCM is slow. Um, and, and often it turns out to be, you know, configurations, yeah. yeah. Collections are your SQL, right? It's yeah. all, I mean, if you keep track of those, then, then um, th yeah. yeah, then you're good. Um, so do you have any final spots on the? Uh, I, I have, uh, the, so the final one here would be accounts. And this, this, is, uh, this is like super, super important because, I mean, we, we, we still see uh, administrators using the same account for client push for uh, for network access, uh, you know, for joint domain and all of that, and um, and they don't need to be domain admins. They don't need to be <laughs> domain admins, and um, one of them is actually stored on the machine in WMI. So yeah. that would be the network access account. Yes. Meaning, if you have an agent, uh, an SCCM agent installed, we could go in there and get, um, the, info. And get the uh, username and the password. Yeah, same from during the deployment. Yeah. That account is also used to access content on DPs and, and that same thing. If you know what you're doing, you can actually yeah. get yeah. that information. Yeah. So for the, uh, I would say, especially for the network access account, I mean, you, make, you need to make sure that that account, uh, you remove you know, all permissions from that account, Normal right? Normal rights, yeah. yeah. And shouldn't be able to log on locally and, and anyth anything like that. Um, uh, Roger Sanders, he has a very good blog post on you know what you should do with the account, and yep. uh, Kim Oppelfalz also have a very very good blog post on yep. those. You should definitely go in and, and, and read those. Otherwise, you will you you know you will end up in our next next horror stories <laughs> from the real world. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're done. I think we're done. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. Well. Thank you, sir. Thanks for for joining <laughs> us here and. Uh, Thanks yeah. for, uh, for stopping by. Yeah, and have a great night. Thank you, guys. <laughs>